Good afternoon and welcome again to the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. And we have our usual uh, strange and wonderful collection of articles from across the web and across science uh, for the last seven days. So without further ado, I guess we might as well jump into the sorts of things we're going to be doing. <laughs> Indeed. So we're going to be looking at black holes, uh, multicellular life. We're going to be looking at hangover cures. Uh, we're obviously going to be talking about uh, some of this week's Cyblogs articles, which uh, range from science communication through to alternative remedies. And Elf, what have you got? Oh, I have some amazing nanofluidics, which is a topic very close and dear to my heart, <laughs> and also the ethics of creating artificial life. Very cool. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Superb. All right. Well, I'm going to jump uh, straight in. Um, and the first piece this week is about supermassive black holes. Uh, supermassive in this case just meaning very, 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 well, not only big, but of course dense. And, and currently, um, current cosmological thinking is that galaxies have supermassive black holes residing at the center of them. And we have one at the center of our galaxy, our galaxy, of course, being the Milky Way. Um, but, of course, the tricky thing with looking for black holes is, is twofold. While we're sure that they're scattered throughout our galaxy, uh, they're often a bit small. And it's sort of, I mean, looking for a needle in a haystack is would be really, really easy compared to looking for black holes in galaxies. And part of the reason for that, of course, is that they absorb everything, including light. So, so this is an invisible needle within a haystack. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's of course, how they ended up with the name black hole, is that light, light is not even um, able to escape them. So then it becomes a question of, well, how does one look for these things? And particularly, we're, we're interested in the supermassive black hole at, at the center of our galaxy. And so this week in Arizona, there's a conference being held, uh, which will lay the, the groundwork for an attempt to actually have a look at this, this supermassive black hole. Um, now, they're called the Event Horizon uh, telescope team, which is pretty cool, because that's exactly what they're going to be looking. They're going to be looking for the event horizon around this very large black hole. Now, what what we think will happen is that if Einstein's equations are correct, if the general theory of relativity is correct, this 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 matter, this ring of matter that forms around a, a black hole, will be uh, in the shape of a circle. Which, which, which makes kind of sense. And the reason that they think there's a ring of matter around a black hole is that, um, well, I'm, I'm going to quote here directly from uh, Shepard Doleman, <laughs> who's the principal investigator of the EHT, and he says, black holes are like babies. They are very messy eaters. A lot of what a black hole tries to eat ends up sprayed across the galaxy. So we know what to look for. It's, it's, we're not looking for the black hole itself. We're looking for the clues that it's, it's been there. I guess it's the opposite of the emperor's new, new clothes. We're looking for the clothes even though we can't see the emperor. And <laughs> w- <laughs> what they're going to do or what the EHT program plans to do is they plan to coordinate 50 uh, radio telescopes right across uh, Earth to focus on this black hole um, center. Now, some fun facts here. Apparently, the black hole has around... 4 million times the mass of our sun and is about 26,000 light years away. So it's a long way away. If you were traveling at light speed, it would take you 26,000 years to get there. So we don't have to worry about, you know, hitting it next next week or anything like that. <laughs> um, and they, they say that trying to, to, to image this from Earth is the equivalent of looking for a grapefruit on the sun. And of course, it's an invisible grapefruit on the sun, but looking for maybe the ring that it would have left in the dust as it landed. Um, <laughs> so, but they think they're going to be able to do this. Now, what they've already done is they've done a preliminary scan just to check if there is actually anything there. And, um, they use three network radio telescopes and they've, they've seen that, yeah, there is an object there. So what they're going to do over the next three to four years is train in all of these other telescopes. And the reason for that is to get a really big array. So basically have unprecedented, uh, um, sort of visualization power. It's going to need the power of something like, uh, yeah, 2,000 times as powerful as the Hubble to have a look at this. But they reckon three to four years from now, we may actually be able to see what's there and be able to study it, of course, because this is going to be fascinating. The, the stuff that it's going to be spitting out, um, the, Hawking radio, uh, the Hawking radiation alone should be just awesome to have a look at. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. The other thing I'd like to point out is that... Um, so we can imagine how hard it is to see an invisible 
thing <laughs> just full stop right <laughs> but this isn't just an invisible thing this is an invisible thing packed in an area of space that is full of ridiculously bright things this is true additional to that just like the cloaking uh, thing we mentioned on TOSP a couple of weeks ago it bends light around it and thus mm. cloaks itself to our telescopes and eyes so it's just it does not want to be seen at no. all <laughs> so actually being able to capture an image of it will be incredible. It's extraordinarily yeah. exciting. Well, no I idea what it will look like. I remember when I was younger and sort of the whole idea of when black holes were still, you know, up for, for debate and this idea that there may be supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies was still very, very much up for, you know, serious debate. People just weren't sure that that wasn't crazy, crazy, scary madness. <laughs> 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 it's cool watching the progress of science over the years. Yeah, now it just comes up in daily conversation. Pretty much. <laughs> right, well, moving right along, the next thing is from me. And uh, you'll have to forgive me this week because two of my articles are actually from the journal Nature Nanotechnology. But it's my favorite journal by a long way, so it's you, you will forgive me. This first one is kind of a, a tip of the hat to some amazing research that's gone on, and it's in an area called nanofluidics. Now, nanofluidics is looking at the flow of all sorts of different liquids like water or blood or anything else that happens to be around on really small length scales. And this has a bunch of different really, really useful effects. And there's actually a growing industry worldwide of... Um, making these little things called labs on a chip. It's essentially a tiny piece of plastic that you can introduce a liquid, so that could be blood, it could be urine, it could be saliva, it could be water, and you can use them to detect all sorts of different things. The reason they're developing them is that you only need a tiny amount of the liquid, and you don't have to plug them into wall sockets, you don't have to put them through centrifuges or anything. They do all of this diagnostic, essentially energy-free, on a chip that's you know the size of one of your fingers. Fingers. So this is really, really cool research. That's microfluidics. Nanofluidics <laughs> is a thousand times smaller again, and nanofluidics is my particular area of research. This particular article uh, is looking at some very, very delicate Nanofluidics. So this is this is uh, uh, this is cool even on nanofluidic standards. <laughs> what these researchers have done is that they've managed to control the mixing of two droplets of liquid. And when you do this in uh, micro technology, usually you can get, uh, you can have an accuracy of about 1,000 billionth of a litre. So you can control really, really small amounts of liquid. What these researchers have done is that they have increased that by a factor of a million. They can now control the mixing of liquids down to a billionth of a billionth of a litre. <laughs> <laughs> and the way they've done this is cool as well, right? They've copied nature. So we have these little um, these little bubbles within our cells, and they're constantly mixing and shuttling different things like energy or fuel or skeletal stuff in and around our cells and DNA all the time. And they have to be for our, our cells to work as they do. What these guys have done is they've got some of the smallest of these, and they've kind of turned them to their own purpose. So they've they've um, they've mixed them together. And they've managed to change one to have a big positive charge on its surface and one to have a big negative charge. So when you mix these together in solution, they come together. But that's not really enough because this is far, far smaller than visible light will allow us to see. And it's also occurring far, far faster than even our really detailed um, electron microscopes can see. Mm. So what they've done is within these little bubbles that they're mixing together, they've put things that fluoresce, things that light up when you mix them together. And what they can do now is that in real time, they can watch these tiny little bubbles mixing together. And they can control the mixing by changing the surface properties. And it turns out that, uh, that they've actually used this to monitor um, reactions of, uh, of enzymes with these kind of little fluorescent things. So this allows you to really effectively and really tightly control and observe the effects of mixing things on these tiny, tiny scales. It's, uh, it's going to change a lot <laughs> of, of therapeutics and diagnostics, and I'm struggling to explain how 
epic this really is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you think it'll change things, Alf? Or, or what effects do you think it's going to have? Well, modern diagnostics are essentially uh, a, a one one way. Essentially, so you'll you'll have a little surface, and you'll apply something to the surface, and if whatever you're detecting is there, the surface will, will light up, mm. right? So that's one way. What these guys can do is you can because they're using a bubble, and because the bubbles are fusing together, uh, you can do more than one reaction. So you can have your little bubble, then you can add these new bubbles, and they might fuse together and light up, or they might not. And if that doesn't work, you can just keep adding more of different types of bubbles until something fuses. And you can ah. keep doing this again and again and again and again. And each time you get a successful fusion, it lights up more and more and more. So you have a really detailed record of what's going on on the nanoscale, right. which is just epic. <laughs> that is. So vastly more efficient as well yeah. and, and just more, yeah. more wide-ranging. Yeah. That's brilliant. And really exciting. <laughs> I can't wait to see uh, once they do kind of uh, PCR and um, microarrays down in this as well, because oh, wow. uh, what they've got going down here is a pretty standard enzymatic reaction. It's just uh, it's a horseradish peroxidase, which for those of you that aren't into your biotech, is a really stock standard basic yeah. reaction, which well, has been really well studied, which is why they used it. Mm. But now, of course, you can go ahead and expand this into all kinds of other things. Ah, ooh, that's very, very, very cool. Thank you. It's shiny, <laughs> brightly coloured as well. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Which, which was the fluorescing pro uh, protein that they used, GFP? Um, I'm not actually sure. I don't think they use GFP, but they oh. also use uh, a few different ones. It's okay. an FRET dye. And I don't know what FRET stands for. It'll be fluorescent resonance. Resonance. Uh, yeah. Easy. Wait. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking this up frantic. Fluorescent resonance, resonance energy, energy transfer. transfer. <laughs> there we go. There I knew go. it was something like that. Cool. So there you go for our audience. That's what the kind of dye that they used was in case you were interested. Um, probably pretty difficult to put on your T-shirts for now. So don't get overly excited. <laughs> um, right, I'm going to skip on. Uh, this is also coming from the tales of the small books. Um, I got this out of uh, Wired Science. It's it's pretty cool. So, of great interest to science has been the whole transition from single-celled organisms, which is sort of things like bacteria and algae, which which are phenomenally cool, but fairly limited in terms of what they can do sometimes. Um, and the transition from single cell to multicellular, which allows you to do things like have arms and mouths and science podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now, they've been studying this for years and years and years and years and years and not had a great deal of luck. Uh, there, there have been some really other things that have come out of it, um, really interesting uh, organisms. Uh, Richard Lenski's E. coli story, that's, that's very well known. Uh, Google these or I can link to them. Um, uh, visible to the eye bacterial biofilms, they're not normally that big. Uh, things like that, but no true multicellularity until now. <laughs> ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, ba -ba -da 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 -da. And it only took two months, 60 days. Now... This, this, uh, I must say that this experiment does not mimic um, what would have happened in nature necessarily, but it's a very good proof of concept. So what they did, uh, the, the scientific team, um, was they took, oh, and this was published if anyone's interested in uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, which is generally bloody good. Um, so what the researchers did was they took brewer's yeast, which is a very common single-celled organisms. People use it to, you know, brew things, for example. Uh, and they put them in broth, which had lots of fantastic foodies, uh, which, which the yeasts really like. And what they did is once a day, they shook the flasks and they removed the yeast that settled uh, most rapidly to the bottom. So that was clumping with other yeast cells and, and hence precipitating, precipitating down. Um, and as, as I'm sure some of the audience has by now guessed, this sounds remarkably like selection. And that's exactly what it was. So they found. So they kept doing this once a day: is, is shake them, remove stuff that's settling, and put them in new flasks, right? And then shake those, and and keep going and keep going and keep going and selecting for these clumping cells. And what they found was that within a few weeks, um, uh, well, within a few weeks, the, the cells still retained their their identities as single-celled bodies, just clumped together, but 
at the end of two months, so after 60 days, um, these clumps were a permanent arrangement. So they had gone um, multicellular. And, and in, indeed, each strain, because of course they're making strains of, of these, that's what you call something where you've been selecting and selecting and selecting for it. Um, they not only were just permanent clumps, but they actually displayed all of the sort of the characteristics that you'd associate with multicellular, with higher forms, what, what we call higher forms of life. So there was a division of labor between specialized cells. There were uh, juvenile and adult um, life stages, and they were making multicellular offspring. So this is this is amazing, um, and done purely uh, just using environmental environmental cues. And in fact, now scientists are thinking that possibly one of the reasons that we've not had any success in making multicellular life before from single cellular life is that we were looking in the wrong place. Um, previously, researchers were looking for some sort of genetic imperative or encouragement or something like that, whereas this just shows that if you put um, organisms in an environment which selects for multicellularity they'll go for it. <laughs> and and so, whereas that's, that might be pretty pretty difficult now in nature for multicellularity to, to evolve because of, there are so many multicellular organisms already and, and the competition would be very, very strict and they'd have competitive advantage. They reckon the, the sort of underlying lesson is that rapid radical evolution is, is universal and, and is, in fact, pretty easy to do in uh, the right circumstances. So, that's really interesting because that's very, very much sort of paradigm shifting in how we thought about this sort of thing and how we thought about evolution. But, of course, this could be very, very useful. So, for example, you could use it to um, breed single-celled organisms into uh, complex or multicellular forms that, that you could use in biotechnology. So, let's say you want to have something that makes ethanol or, I don't know, some kind of novel compound. So, you could either use genetic engineering or you could just do selection experiments to shape their evolution, which is what we've been doing for, what, tens of thousands of years with um, animals and agriculture. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's very, very cool proof of concept stuff. I love it. It really is, and it's sort of one of those, like, uh, when I read this, I couldn't help thinking, well, yeah, that makes so much sense. Why have we only thought of this now? But <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's I one guess of those we haven't things. Only... Yeah, it's so obvious that you wouldn't necessarily think to do it. But still, it's a very, very clever experiment, actually, and a very clever proof of concept. Mm, I think I'm, My guess is that we've tried it in the past. We probably just haven't had a great deal of success. Yeah. <laughs> well, It I doesn't... That. Yeah. Oh, well, moving along to other issues of life, once again, my second Nature Nanotech article this week is uh, um, a thesis kind of opinion piece on molecular golems. By uh, <laughs> It's written by a guy called Chris Toumey, T-O-U-M-E-Y. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But it's a really interesting article, and if you do have access to Nature Nanotechnology, I do encourage you to go and read it. But essentially, he's drawing parallels between the golem stories inherent in Jewish, uh, Jewish sorry, history uh, and myth, and the issues that biotechnology and nanotechnology is coming across today. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Jewish history, um, I had to bone up myself quite a bit, uh, these stories of golems... Uh, originate by uh, a holy man using divine knowledge to bring a clay imitation of a human to life, then using it for deeds which started off being pure and good and eventually ended up being rather nefarious and not good. <laughs> uh, and the most famous example of these ultimately is uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, how does this relate to nanotechnology, nanomedicine, and biotechnology? Well, a lot of people are beginning to argue that you can address the ethical implications of some of the issues that nanotechnology and biotechnology are coming across by looking at these ancient golem stories. So, for instance... <clears throat> Some of the, and, and, and this is generic across science, it's not just nanoscience at all. Um, essentially, some of the questions that are popping up now are things like how much of a person's body can be replaced by artificial limbs and organs before he's no longer a man, either a man in a spiritual sense, a man in a legal sense, a man in a biological sense. Mm -hmm. But this is an issue that we're probably going to have to confront 
at least legally, within our lifetime, with mm-hmm. the terms of prosthetics. But even more advanced than that, these uh, yeah. these nanobots and these r- repairing enzymes and nanomachines that we're developing as mm-hmm nanomedicine tools for the future, Mm. especially with things like uh, Ritalin now being used by students to improve their performance in exams. Is this base humanity or or is it moving forward? (laughs) Are we humans or are we becoming something more like golems? And uh, I mean, uh, things like um, biologists synthesizing Sorry, biologists synthesizing sperm and ovum to make uh, humans without parents for instance, uh, it's uh, huge ethical implications there, and it's not too far away. We can already do things like IVF, and you know we can combine uh, the genetic material from from same-sex couples into a, a viable offspring now. And the the author poses the question: Is this creature a human or an android? Um, to me, I have very specific views, which I'm not going to share, but I think <laughs> these are issues that do uh, that do deserve thinking about. And the mm-hmm. final one I like is some of the new research that's going on into improving the intelligence of both humans and non-human animals. So mm-hmm. if the intelligence of something like dolphins or other higher animals approaches humans and human intelligence, do these animals then deserve a human-like status in our society? And I, I love that idea. Imagine mm. having, you know, an ocean-going population of human intelligent dolphins. Um, and, you know, if their intelligence is us... <laughs> well, who's to say they're not? <laughs> but yes. oh, exactly. I mean, we probably just can't understand them yet, which is a fault of our own, not of theirs. Especially if you follow people like Douglas Adams, which I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so long and thanks for all the fish. You'd think, though, they would have done that by now if they were going to. But um, <laughs> this, this is fascinating. So, so these questions, um, I've also not yet read the paper, but I'm, I'm very keen to now. I'm really glad Alf is, is talking about it on the podcast. But these questions are also being tackled as well um, by the artificial intelligence and artificial life people. So the people on, on very much the other end of the spectrum technologically. And there you do things like, um, you've got things like the Turing test, obviously named for Alan Turing, which tests for um, sentience in an artificial intelligence. And I've got to say that the, the results on some uh, th- some of the Turing test results that they're getting now from uh, conversation engines like Eliza and so forth are getting very close to the point where you wouldn't be able to tell if who's speaking back to you is a very clever algorithm giving you canned responses learned statistically or sentient. But of course then the question is, is there any difference between those two things? If you look at the human brain as a computer, then we do the same thing. Inter- if you look at internet comments. <laughs> well, and, and then, of course, yes, then you can argue that we should probably just all be nuked from orbit. Um, well, there's but, a brilliant XKCD comment on that. Uh, comment on that. <laughs> um, but, of course, the, the other question as well is, is what defines personhood? So, as I was saying, in, in a legal sense, in an ethical sense, in a moral sense, what defines personhood? And, and certainly one of the... Um, solutions that I've heard to that question, and again, this is very much on the sort of silicon life form uh, side of things, which which I, I read about, um, is if it can claim personhood, it has it. So if something is sentient enough to say, I'm a person, and I claim my rights as such, then they are to be afforded those rights. Now, that's going to be very difficult to do if you're looking at like biotech organisms, but it may still remain the case that Anybody, they can be as augmented as they like or as different as they like, but if they believe that they are sentient and believe that they are a person, then maybe that's enough. I don't know. It's a fascinating, um, it's an ongoing, very, very serious discussion as people realize that it's going to be happening, a lot of this stuff, relatively quickly. Yeah, I would I would hazard a guess to say within our lifetimes. If I, not within. I think within less than that. <laughs> well, I mean, it depends when the zombie sheep arrive, obviously, but I, <laughs> I, I tend to think I'm, I'm on the, the side of things that think that that's going to be within the next few decades. Uh, if zombie um, sheep turn up, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain we won't notice, knowing knowing some of the sheep that I know are really pretty <laughs> stupid. <laughs> but I'm, ju- I'm just going to uh, close off on this article yeah. by saying this is by no means the first time this parallel has been drawn. Originally, there was an article uh, published in 1966 by a guy called Gershom Scholem, uh, who discussed that uh, computers at that time, back in 1966, should be renamed Golem Aleph, which is, translates to Golem number one. 
Nice. And it, essentially, his reasoning is that we created something that was a technical servant of man's needs, and that is the definition of a golem. Mm -hmm. And then he finished his article by asking his readers not to fear, not to worry too much, but just to think about it. And I just want to close by quoting him. He finishes his article by saying, develop peacefully and don't destroy the world, which is, I think, a sentiment we can all echo. <laughs> I, I think the man had it about right. <laughs> Uh, oh, cool. All righty. Well, uh, I'm going to move on to the next piece here. Um, and this, this came out to much hoo-ha and, and excitement and all kinds of things uh, earlier this week when the world was triumphantly told that we may have a hangover cure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> drugs everywhere, <laughs> united. <laughs> oh, man, not only drugs, but everybody. Uh, so this is really interesting. Now, of course, there's, there's consistently research, possibly anecdotal, by people doing strange things like eating raw eggs in the morning. Or, but people are consistently trying to get over the problem of, well, there are a few problems. is how to have a really fantastic night out without getting so canned you don't remember what happened. Um, and, and sometimes doing things that one would rather had not happened. Uh, of course, how to stop the pounding headache, nausea, and, and the whole thing of a really bad hangover the next day. But far more seriously than either of these things cause, uh, is, is alcohol dependence. Um, so what, what's otherwise known as alcoholism to, to some extent or another. Now, there's a lot of research into what's going on. Um, we still – we understand the um, – alcohol breakdown process in the body so alcohol is turned into something into a compound called um, acid aldehyde which is extremely toxic and then that acid aldehyde is turned into <clears throat> acetic acid which is uh, actually used by our bodies as um, an energy source so uh, you see this particularly amongst Asian populations but people who find that they get drunk like insanely easy and their faces normally flush what's happened is the enzyme that's responsible for turning that acid aldehyde that toxic compound into acetic acid uh, that enzyme doesn't really work for them and so they get stuck with with the toxin basically so they, they generally shouldn't drink or should drink very very minimal amounts right so there's a little bit of background now what's happened here is uh, uh, Dr. Jing, I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm so sorry, Jing Liang, um, who is Associate Professor of Pharmacology at the University of California in Los Angeles, um, has noticed something interesting. And what she noticed is this, is that there's a compound called Hovenia, which uh, has been taken as a herbal supplement to treat hangovers in Asia for at least about 500 years and uh, she had noticed that, and because it's also used as a spice, that when people ate uh, food that had been cooked with Hovenia, um, as as well as consuming alcohol, they, they didn't seem to get drunk. So she thought, well, this is very interesting. So, so what can I do about this? So she... Um, isolated the, the active compound, the specific compound that seemed to be blocking the effect, and it's called dihydromyrocetin, or, or I'm just going to call it DHM. And what they did was they started testing it on rats. So they, they had a look at a, they devised a number of tests which would look at, at sort of the effect of alcohol on rats um, on its own, and then the effect of alcohol on rats if they'd been given uh, this DHM, this compound. And apparently drunk rats are pretty much like drunk humans, which, which means they... <laughs> <laughs> they're drunk they and get and angry and shout at each other over the fences yeah and then and then they tell each other how much they love them man um <laughs> but apparently they get drunk and then they lose consciousness so they pass out basically they go to sleep and she said i mean i, I remember seeing in, in other articles is they gave the rats the equivalent uh, of like 20 beers which is a lot of beer and uh, they found that the animals who'd been given DHM uh, didn't really get uh, intoxicated. Or they just said this. Let, let me rephrase that. They didn't show signs of intoxication because, again, we can't talk to the rats and ask them how they're feeling. But they didn't seem to be showing these, uh, the signs. For example, they only slept for about 10 minutes, whereas the ones who'd passed out slept for like 70. Um, and, and some of the rats who'd been given DHM didn't, didn't even sleep at all. Um, and they also found that their uh, symptoms of alcohol dependency were significantly reduced in the rats who'd been administered this drug. Now, I've got the paper and I intend to read it because I'm actually very curious as to how one determines um, alcohol dependency in rats. And so I'll be writing, I guess, a blog post about that at some point this week. But, but that's, um, that's really, really encouraging as well because 
at the moment there aren't um, there are only a, a couple of uh, medications which have been approved by the S FDA for treating alcohol dependence and apparently they all have uh, major side effects and they haven't even been proven particularly in effect uh, particularly effective in treating disorders so so the next step is to take this compound and to start testing it in humans which um, dr uh, Dr. Ling is going to be doing uh, the moment she gets the funding for it, because uh, there, there's a fair amount of of excitement about the potential for this for yeah for not only dependence but for keeping people generally more sober. It means you can go and have a big night, but but perhaps not lose lose it, and and most encouragingly, it all be able to function the next day. Just one thing I am going to point out before we move on is this: uh, this isn't just one standalone study. This actually builds on decades and decades and mm. decades of research into a similar thing. A couple of years ago, a study was published uh, looking at a similar compound that essentially uh, you got rats really, really drunk. You admitted, administered this compound, and they almost immediately, within about five minutes, showed vir virtually no signs of intoxication whatsoever. There was a problem, however, with this particular compound because it didn't have the same effect on reducing alcohol dependency of the rats. It turns out rats actually quite like getting drunk. So when you administered the compound, what the rats did is that they didn't fall asleep, they didn't show any signs of intoxication, they just kept drinking. And what the rats ended up doing, of course, was dying of alcohol poisoning. Mm. So they didn't move this on to human trials because they, I believe, thought the same thing would happen in human beings. <laughs> so this... The, yeah, it does make a certain amount of sense. Uh, you know, generally it's thought that, that passing out is your body's way of protecting you from whatever piece of stupidity you're about to do next and stopping the consumption. Yeah. We should also note that the, uh, the the direct kind of mechanism of alcohol intoxication, how it directly impacts on the molecular scale, uh, things like your neurons and how it impairs motor function and everything else like that, isn't actually as well known as you might expect. We know far more about the direct mechanisms of, say, something like Panadol or aspirin than we do from alcohol and its components. Not throughout lack of trying, of course. There's been heaps of research into it. It's just an incredibly complex system, and we don't really have our handle on exactly how this works. Yeah. So it'll be really interesting to see the results of these studies, and fingers crossed it has a big drop in the alcohol dependency effect, because that will make it legitimate for human use <laughs> Ab well absolutely I, I'm certainly yeah I'm looking forward to reading that paper um, particularly to see if she has figured out um, what exactly it is doing so which receptors it's blocking uh, as as Alf says it, it could otherwise be a little bit worrying as well <laughs> In, in terms of what, what it allows people to do um, but, but, but good research nonetheless alright so I've, mm. yeah I, I so speaking say, of science communication -y stuff, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so, so I'm, go, I'm going right forward with my segues this week. <laughs> um, this week has been Science Online uh, 2012. So this is an online science communication um, <clears throat> conference, and our uh, several SI bloggers, but the one we've picked up is Grant Jacobs, who blogs at Code for Life, um, has written a really interesting post outlining some of what he thinks is the most interesting articles and discussions that occurred at the conference. Now, there's heaps and heaps and heaps of stuff here, and I do encourage you to go and uh, have a look at the specific videos and uh, other tweets and things that have come out of it, but the particular... Uh, diagram <laughs> that Grant has posted is titled Why Do Scientists Hate and Fear the Media? And essentially it's, it's a flowchart for good etiquette between scientists and journalists when talking about a, a, a scientific idea and concept in order to get the best out of it. Uh, mm. It's got links to some really, really cool online resources. It tells you how to deal with hate mail. It tells you to build a relationship and not to be afraid of sounding stupid. It's just also, it's brightly coloured. <laughs> I, I was going to say it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just uh, just a heads up to an, an amazing event that unfortunately I didn't manage to follow that closely because I was stuck in the lab, but I'm just going through some of the stuff now, and it's amazing. It's great to see so much quality science communication going on online um, in 2012. 
Mm. And and a, a point of clarification there, the conference uh, is really cool because people can obviously take part in the sessions via Twitter and so forth, but it's it's mostly about science and science communication online. So it covers a lot of stuff around um, blogging, around tweeting, um, pulling out pulling out some of the I'm just pulling out at random here um, cybersecurity defense against the dark arts uh, the special perils and pleasures of medical blogging um, there are tips for people who would like to write better um, effective research in nature photography um, math future network of communities a year in review uh, Sex, gender, and controversy, writing to educate, writing to titillate, uh, the punches, the punchlines and perils of science humor. That one would have been good. <laughs> there was all kinds of things. So as I've pointed out, and we'll, we'll link to Grant's post and also to the uh, SCI-12 website, there's, there's a huge wealth of information here. Many of them have videos. Uh, more of them have um, notes of various sorts. And it's a very sort of happy, chatty community. And they do talk throughout the year. So if you've got questions or anything um, or, or, or you want to contact the speakers, you know, this is not, this is pretty easy to do, in fact. Yeah, it's a great resource, I think. Mm, so... The next one's, well, rather than going to, to large amounts of details, I'm going to say that this, this week on Cyblogs has been pretty um, alternative therapy focused, if I might put it like that. Um, there came the news that um, uh, uh, Professor Paul Callahan, who is unfortunately very, very ill uh, with cancer, uh, and he's one of our top science communicators and one of the top uh, scientists slash technologists in the country, um, it came out that recently that he was going to be trying high level doses of vitamin C uh, as a possible therapy for his cancer. He's now at the point basically where he'll try anything and he's been honest about that. And this raised a lot of eyebrows because <clears throat> there was some controversy I think this year or last year uh, about somebody claiming that it had saved uh, a spouse or a friend who'd been dying of flu and blah 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 blah. The problem being of course that there is actually no clinical evidence that mega high doses of vitamin C do anything and so this this week uh, Callahan came out and said that he's um, he f he's found no evidence that this therapy has worked for him he st he uh, in fact he said I have as a result learned enough to say that there is absolutely no evidence of any beneficial effect of high dose intravenous vitamin C in my case, and uh, in fact, there's a there's an article on it by Kate Newton. She goes on to talk about how he's concerned that advocates of alternative remedies are using um, his his desperation basically to promote uh, to promote their treatments, which which he's a little bit a little bit uncomfortable with. But so so there's an interesting article about that, and then I'm not sure if our readers caught this, but. Over the last week or so, or possibly the week before, the New Zealand Herald has had a series of pieces on uh, alternative relaxation and remedies. Um, they looked at Hirudo therapy, which is leech therapy. They explored Japanese gabun yoku, uh, Indian Ayurveda, Korean Jimjibang, and Thai massage. And it's gotten a number of our bloggers extremely hot and bothered. And the reason for this is that while the... Um, while the piece is generally focused on the sort of relaxation benefits of these therapies, the bloggers felt that there was no way that these therapies should be talked about in this fashion because the, the relaxation is being used as a smokescreen by the practitioners to put them forward as having actual medical benefits. And the problem with that is that it could be preventing people from getting, you know, proper treatment that, that, that works. So there are a number of pieces um, on Cyblogs about that that we'll link to around the various around the various therapies. It has been uh, a, a regular uh, trying to think of a nicer way to say this, but I can't. So it's been an interesting week on Cyblogs and in the background uh, <laughs> because of all the stuff that's been going around. I've just got to say yeah. that my favourite quote of it all was published by one of our Cyblogs that we interviewed a few weeks back, uh, Susie Wiles, mm. and this was uh, published in the Sunday Star Times, uh, adjacent to an article that I believe uh, reported repelling fleas from pets using yep. biophotons, which was one of my favourite pieces of bollocks from throughout the week. Absolutely. And In fact, it was homeopathy and quantum mechanics. <laughs> it was stunning. 
It was it was a stunning article, but Susie's quote just capped it for me. She is published in bold in the paper as saying, This raised every red flag of being bollocks. When you read it, it is just a load of nonsense. <laughs> so congratulations to Susie from that. That was that was just stunning. We couldn't be prouder of her. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's true. Oh my God, it's ridiculous. Um, and then the final thing I think is uh, is um, a post by a a, a Cyblogs blogger called Amy Woodcraft, uh, and she blogs for Miss Science. Who's that? <laughs> Some random girl. She pops up occasionally. Um, and this is about citizen science. So, so I'm really interested in tracking citizen science projects around the world and just seeing what people are doing because I think it's fantastic. And uh, I explain why in the post and what's in this, uh, citizen science is basically getting the public involved again in science, either uh, collecting data or analyzing data. You can think about things like Galaxy Zoo. You can think about Folded if you want to uh, think of that as a uh, citizen science project, all of these things. Anyway, so there's a new one, and it's called Globe at Night, and it's taking place over four periods this year, so 14th to 23rd January, 12th to 21st February, 13th to 22nd March, and 11th to 20th April. No matter if you didn't write those down, we'll link to it. Um, and the idea here is that it's actually a, a, a protest as much as anything, or, or trying to raise awareness around light pollution. The idea being that our skies, particularly in urban areas, are no longer black at night. We can no longer see the stars. Um, I remember uh, growing up in Joburg, the sky generally got to a sort of very dark, bruised mauve color. That was it, um, because of the light and the dust that, that the light was reflecting off. And um, light pollution is is, well, the Globe at Night people say it's not only threatening our right to starlight, which I think is, is very quaint, uh, but it can affect energy consumption, um, wildlife, and health. It, it can do all kinds of strange things to the circadian rhythm uh, of animals and, and even of people. For example, so this, this campaign's been running uh, for two weeks each winter and, or spring, depending on where you are in the world, for the last six years. So what they do is they get people to send in uh, observations, naked eye observations, which you can then have a look at. So 115 countries, uh, 66,000 measurements over the last six years. Um, it's been really cool. And so what you have to do to take part is you find your latitude and your longitude. Um, you then find Orion, Leo, or Crux, depending on what you call them and where you are. Uh, and, and you need to be doing so more than an hour after sunset. So generally around 8 to 10 local time. I think in New Zealand it would probably be closer to 11 in midsummer. At the, at the moment, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you match your nighttime sky to one of the uh, magnitude charts that, that the website provides. You report your observation and then you can compare it to, to tens of thousands of other ones around uh, the world. So a really cool thing that, that'll get you involved and get you involved in your night sky, but you'll also be contributing to a profoundly interesting data set. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. And those in the other citizen science uh, events, initiatives, projects, whatever you want to call them, uh, really do give me kind of hope for the future, I think. <laughs> they, they do, yeah. Um, there, there was news, I think, yesterday, the day before, that a British television audience had, had helped to discover a potential new planet. I mean, the scope for, for discovery, once you democratize it, becomes enormous. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm, I'm excited to see the, the kind of next citizen science things as well. Yeah. And uh, this particular one is an issue very close to my heart because if you go out in Wellington, as I do, and uh, tell people about the stars, you've essentially got about 30 to pick from on a good night. And this is out of about 400 billion that are in our galaxy. And all you need to do is go out somewhere dark really truly dark and look up at the stars and the number that you miss being anywhere with humans around is, is just mind-boggling yeah it's absolutely well, you, stunning you can actually see the milky way you can see the arms you, yeah. you get you get you can see where we are which is <laughs> is amazing i remember again i think you could generally see one or two stars in the sky in joba good night if you were lucky, the very, very bright ones. Sometimes it depended how much crap there was in the air, uh, crap being the technical term for smog and dust. Um, <laughs> but, but I remember being a kid and going out to uh, sort of, we were just over the border of Zimbabwe and looking up and seeing the night sky. And it was my first memory of actually seeing that. And I spent like a ton of time just 
lying on the ground. And for years afterwards, whenever we went outside of the city limits, which is generally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, um, and just, you know, lying in sleeping bags, looking, looking at the stars. It's, uh, it's, there's nothing else like it in, no. on, uh, on Earth. <laughs> no. it's, it's a lot easier here in New Zealand, we may point out to our listeners. Uh, well, m- possibly not here in Auckland, but, but a lot of the rest of New Zealand, it doesn't take very far to get into somewhere where it's decently dark at night. Yeah, I know, absolutely. And, Which is cool. And even in our cities, we, they're not that bad as no. things go. No, they're really but not. we should yep. stop waxing lyrical about how beautiful our <laughs> night sky is and, and move on to kind of finishing up. Yep. So there are a bunch of really interesting events going on this week. Uh, there's on Tuesday at 11 o'clock down in Dunedin, there's a lecture on preventing suicide in late, ni- in late life Sorry, through social connectedness. Awesome. Um, that's in the psychology apart- department down at Dunedin... And again, we'll link to that. So University of Otago, um, we'll keep moving because there's heaps of events this week. Yeah. Uh, there's a restorative justice uh, colloquia going on in Auckland on Friday. That's right the way through 9 a.m. in the morning till about 6 o'clock in the evening. Amy, is there anything you want to mention? Uh, there's the New Zealand Bioethics Conference, which starts at the... Um end of the week uh, and this is no country for old men and women increasing pressures on the healthcare system of course this is something that is being talked about a lot at the moment and I'm not going to get into my normal rant uh, around that so we'll move on swiftly uh, on Saturday there is Capital Rocks on <laughs> Wellington Rocks introducing our local geology it sounds very exciting people are very thrilled um, then there's oh yeah uh, there's the botanizing summer camp which is ongoing as well we'll link to that um, in the yeah, New Zealand Probability Workshop. That's the one that makes me very excited. I would totally be going to that if I didn't have pesky things like day jobs. Rawr. But uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It, uh, there will be two days each of probability theory and applied probability, which is probably a bit hardcore for me, with an excursion in the middle. Now, I'm not sure what it is that probability worker outers do on excursions possibly go and sit near traffic lights and watch how many people stop when they're supposed to but no, that's statistics not probability well, the probability of there being a complete chaos of complete chaos actually approaches about 100 percent. but yeah <laughs> anyway <laughs> so there's there's a lot of interesting stuff again we will uh we will link to that i'm trying to think if there's anything else uh particularly no no there's 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 nothing else that i can think of All right. Well, as usual, we're going to finish up by saying thanks to everyone who makes this podcast possible. So a huge thanks to State Shirt and Rian Sheehan for our opening and closing themes, respectively. And of course, to the Cyblogs and the Cybloggers for providing us with stories and discussion topics and generally standing up for the little guy. (laughs) Uh, Remember, you can subscribe to TOSP via iTunes. You can follow or listen via YouTube. You can follow our RSS feed or you can watch us on the Zoom Cool Science channel channel and you can find us and other quality science podcasts at sciencepodcasters.org if you've got comments or suggestions or requests or anything else put something on the TOSP blog and if you like us please try and write a review and rate the podcast on iTunes to help get us on the front page or just share a link to this week's podcast on Twitter or Facebook, Google Plus, anything else so other people can find us too if you uh, you can follow all the Cyblogs posts by subscribing to email, Twitter, RSS, all that jazz, uh, just by visiting the Cyblogs homepage at cyblogs.co.nz, and you can help support the site by getting Cyblogs apparel if you so desire. Other than that, you can follow Amy and myself via Twitter or via our respective Cyblogs. And from myself and Amy for the week, stay curious. Indeed. Bye bye. Bye.